Hey, everybody. Let's see, Super J, uh, you're, are we right on the top of the hour then? Yeah, it's exactly two o'clock. We did good. All this right. is the first time we aren't late. <laughs> hey, we, we've been on time before. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I just want to say welcome. If you don't know, oh my God, I don't know how you could not know. Anyway, I'm Marjorie Wildcraft, and um, down in the corner right there is, um, we call him Super J, Jimerson. He is the technical director at the Grow Network, and he keeps the internet up and running and manages all kinds of stuff and definitely holds my hand through technological issues, which arise from time to time. Anyway, I don't want to mess around too much. You need to learn how to grow food. We need to get this webinar launched. So um, let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to share my screen. I've got a PowerPoint presentation, and we will make this happen right now. And I'm going to get this to go here. Okay, so you can grow food, even if you have no experience, you're older, or you're out of shape. And I'm very serious. And I first want to say for just a moment, I am really glad you are here. Uh, we are living through extraordinary times. I mean, what we're starting into right now has never been lived before in human history. Um, and honestly, uh, there's going to be a large uh, let's just say a lot of people are going to be leaving this existence. If you're here, you're interested in growing food and your chances of making it through this period are much, much higher than, than anybody else's. And quite honestly, you need to be here because when this thing utterly collapses, which is what the process that we're involved in, we need to have people around to rebuild it. And we need to have good people with big hearts and, and people who are practical and that is the part of this whole experience that I'm looking forward to is the actual rebuilding. But we do have to go through the collapse first. And um, but by the way, I really do want to be in community with you. I've spent many years building a community of people around me that are very practical and pragmatic uh, and focused on how to live without the existing systems. And I will have a way for you to reach. I want you to be a part of uh, the community and I want to work with you directly. We have a really great group of people. So I will get to that. Um, toward the end of the webinar, but let's get going first. So you know that there's all kinds of things breaking down: the financial systems, the uh, you know the, the economy, the government, um, you know whatever. There's all kinds of things breaking everywhere. The purpose of this co conversation is we're first of all going to talk about the global food crisis, so you realize how absolutely imperative it is that you start growing food. Uh, and then we will get into solutions on how to get you started. And again, even if you don't have any experience. So there are three major malfunctions. Actually, there are like dozens of malfunctions. But the three biggies are global crop production it has been destroyed by drought, flooding, freezing, bizarre weather um, all over the world. Uh, so crop production has been down for a long time. And I don't know why I have it. So let's go here. Let's just talk globally about the top 10 food producing countries in the world. So number one is China, United States, Brazil. Now, the reason that the United States and Germany are bolded is that those are the only two countries in the top 10 that actually are net exporters. So every country does do some exporting, but most of them do a lot more importing, and only two of the top 10 in the world actually are net exporters. Let's go through some of these real quickly so you can get a sense of what's going on globally. China has been talking about a famine for several years, and they are struggling to meet basic food demands. I will actually have more to say about um, China in, in um, a little bit later in the presentation. They're huge. Um, let's talk about how much that they, they are buying a lot of grain from the United States. And, um, to, to give you a perspective in, uh, 2021, it, actually this number is bigger. Uh, they imported from the United States 57.1 million metric tons. Now I don't really know what that means. And I'm sure you don't know what that means, but to put that into perspective, the year before in 2020, it was only uh, 15 million metric tons. And then in um, 2019, it was like almost, you know, 7.98 million metric tons. So they are scaling up at just a phenomenal rate. Um, and in fact, last year, China hoarded over half 
of the world's grain, which has absolutely been pushing up global prices. And um, they know something is coming. If China's hoarding grain, I think that you should be backing up your food supplies too. Then the phenomenon, like half of the world's grain, China bought up. Uh, and they know there's, uh, they've been knowing for quite a few years, and they have gone down some interesting routes. And here's this AI trash can is designed that if you're throwing out, it does facial recognition. And if you're throwing out a uh, food a uh, bag, you know, a bag from the restaurant has too much food and waste in it, then they ding your social credit, credit score or something like that. They have another thing called a clean plate initiative. They've been doing a lot of things to try and get their people more efficient and cut down on food waste because they know that a famine is coming. All right, let's shift over to the United States. Um, we've had a huge drought last year, and then the year before we had some problems. Uh, this is uh, 2021. I happened to be in Colorado at this time, and almost everybody was sick with respiratory issues because of the smoke all over the western side of the United States. A lot of those country, all the, a lot of those states, California, uh, you know, Idaho, Wyoming. Um, they're big food producing, like potatoes, wheat, uh, grains. Uh, California is a lot of vegetables and fruits. Production is down. Let's go to Brazil. Um, ravaged by COVID, Brazil faces a hunger epidemic. And um, there are tens of millions of Brazilians are facing hunger. I, that's a lot of people. Um, let's talk about India. Uh, actually, and this was in July of 2021, there's, these reports were coming out, and I'm sure it hasn't gotten any better, that even middle-class Indians are lining up at food banks to get food. They have a hunger catastrophe happening in India. Russia, oh my gosh, Russia's been taking the news lately. They have been coming close to being self-sufficient, food self-sufficient. Um, this is only going up to 2018. I couldn't find any more current data, but as you know, with the current war going on, uh, it's almost irrelevant. There's like imports and exports almost out of Russia completely. Um, even still, even before this whole war started, uh, Russia was introducing all kinds of export re restrictions. And those export restrictions are a big deal all over the planet now. Almost every country is starting to enact them. Here's Thailand has been banning exports. Uh, Russia has been suspending their fertilizer exports and suspending fertilizer is about the same as suspending food exports. Um, Hungary bans its grain exports. The Re Republic of Moldova, Moldova? Okay, we'll figure out how to pronounce that later. Uh, Egypt banning export, the Ukraine banning export. Uh, it's going on and on, uh, Vietnam off and on. Um, lots and lots of problems with uh, production. And then, and then um, just exporting by governments. Um, we're actually heading into a period where every country is going to be becoming more of its own nation and less and less global trade. So let's also talk about the other big thing. Supply chain disruptions means food can't be delivered. And, uh, you know, the economist just had a big thing why these supply chain problems are not going away. Uh, the insurance journal... Uh, supply chain driven to the breaking point. Um, here's one example. Um, Canada had its biggest port, the Vancouver port, was just completely destroyed. Look at that. And that's only one part of the destruction. There was just whole sections of tr railroad tracks and other things are completely destroyed uh, due to these weather incidents that they had last fall. Uh, Vancouver is, is completely cut off by road and by rail from the rest of Canada. Uh, Canada used to export about 5% of the world's wheat. Uh, so even though they aren't a net exporter of food, they did export some. And now that is not getting out to the global uh, consumption. Now, I mentioned I would get back to China. And China is buying so much corn that its ports are getting clogged. And if you've been following the news, which you may or may not have, but containers, shipping containers have gone up by 500%. Like you used to be able to buy a you know, a 40-foot container for $2,000. It's now $5,000 to get a 40-foot container. And the reason why is China has been buying up half of the world's grain, right? Well, how do you store half of the world's grain? Like, you don't just build, I mean, they haven't built a whole bunch of grain silos. 
what they've been doing is keeping the grain in those containers and they're all stacked up on ships or, you know, yards everywhere all around the ports of China. And the reason that the ports are getting clogged is they just have so much corn and other grain that they've bought. So China has been absolutely contributing to uh, the supply chain crisis. Well, here's, here's another one, the shipping container shortage, snarling. One real fun thing we have at the Grown Network, we have a really active and engaged forum area where, oh my gosh, I've been doing this so long and have just wonderful community of people. Uh, and one of the one of the really interesting topics that I like is uh, anybody seeing new shortages and people are always posting up, you know, photos of what's going on in their area. And we're up to 12 pages on this now of people posting up stuff. And one of the things I really appreciate about the Grow Network is you know, we're all getting to know each other. And um, for example, during the trucking convoy thing in Canada, you know, I was talking directly to people that I've known for a long time in the forums about what, hey, what are you really seeing versus all the various media outlets uh, and their various angles on reporting. So I uh, love the Grow Network forums. And <laughs> this shortages one is crazy. Uh, yeah. Now, the other big thing is inflation and hyperinflation. It means you won't be able to afford food pretty soon. I really only have one chart on this. This is the Fed. This is the M1 money, su money supply. And it, it's just skyrocketing. And, you know, this means we are going to have inflation and hyperinflation. Um, official inflation went up to 7.9% in February. I saw a very, very good economic analysis uh, last year on this. And the guy was saying when the official inflation rate, which we all know is not the real rate, gets up to eight and a half percent, then it will become absolutely apparent to everybody. And that's when the real panic buying is going to start to kick in. I've been predicting that would happen in um, spring or summer of this year. And I think we're pretty much on track for that. The point of that message is now is you need to go out and buy backup food supplies right now while they are still affordable and before everybody else figures out that this is, is going on. Now, the United Nations is not prone to uh, clickbait or sensational headlines, but even they put this out. The pandemic could cause a famine of biblical proportions. This is the UN World Food Program that's saying that, and they know it. The numbers are very straightforward. I was just in an interview with Mike Adams, and he's like, it, it's going to be at least one or two billion people that are going to die of starvation, and it's just numbers. It's very hard to talk about that personally. I, I, I get upset when I think about it, but it may actually be a lot more than that. Let's shift over to how long will this last? And I will tell you how I know exactly how long this will last. In 2015, there was a food chain reaction crisis simulation. It ended up with a global carbon tax. Like, uh, let's think about that. But this was uh, sponsored by Cargill, which is the world's largest privately held company. And they have their fingers in every aspect of food production and delivery on this planet. They are a huge, huge, huge company. And so they uh, sponsored this thing. And I, I, I'm not sure if John Podesta was involved in this, but it's very similar to like the Event 201 thing that we saw just before COVID broke out and then some of the other simulations before 9-11. Uh, and at the time I, I'd seen this, I wasn't as aware of how important these simulations were. And they had, a, their basic thing was, hey, something would happen in 2021 and then, in uh, 2020, and then in 2021, food prices would go up by about 40%. And then from then on, um, they would go up in the second and third year to uh, another 100% per year, and then it would get above 400% above baseline, and they would stay at that for the remainder of the decade. Uh, they also predicted uh, large, large numbers of, of death across the planet due to starvation. With that would be rampant violence. Uh, and, and countries shutting down, shutting down trade. They, in their simulation, they did not include um, hyperinflation and currency collapse, which is a, an extra variable that we are going to be facing. But basically, we can expect this to last at least a decade is the bottom line for that. Um, and by the way, they're on they're on par. Like this is a chart of the UN gauge. By, by, by the way, the UN FAO has a food price index, which I believe is their baseline number. 
that they do all their analysis from. It went up basically 39% in 2021. So they were right on target for that 40% increase in prices. Um, astonishing how these uh, scenarios seem to be uh, very accurate. The bottom line is you're not going to be able to store enough food to get through this crisis. Uh, so you're going to have to grow your own food. Um, that is actually going to be a really good thing, as I'll show you as we get down into it. And I do not want to discourage you from buying backup. I mean, I want to emphasize again, go out and buy backup food supplies right now. We have a very limited time window, but then you also absolutely need to get started growing your own food. This was back in 2020. Uh, we will absolutely see flash mobs. Uh, this was in Mexico, a Mexican rest, uh, Mexican... Uh, Thing. And what I found interesting about this was uh, the, the, the gang that looted this was like, you, you can't leave us without food. It was like they felt uh, like it was their right to go riot in mass and grab food, which, you know, I don't know if I agree with that or not, but there was an entitlement to food. By the way, I just also saw this. This is a line for a grocery store in China, which is apparently starting to happen more and more in China. And this is what this next slide was really shocking to me. I, I lived in Asia for about a decade, and I'm going to tell you the Chinese are very, very peaceful people. There are fights breaking out in grocery stores over getting food in China. Um, and you can believe this is, is starting to happen everywhere else in the world. And, um, you know, th this, is, this is coming here in the United States also. Um, I just happened to snap this photo uh, yesterday at a local grocery, cat food. I don't like. I don't know why the cat food aisle was so empty. We're all getting used to these empty shelves. You should take this as a warning. Yeah, sometimes they get restocked again, uh, but we're seeing more and more of this, where these retailers try to put something on the shelves to make it not look so bad. But this is. This is where we're headed up. Actually, what's going to happen is these grocery stores are going to be looted and raided, and then they're just going to get boarded up and not used, uh, just like what's going on, uh, you know, like uh, I think Walgreens has shut down a whole bunch of different drugstores across the country just because they couldn't manage uh, the flash mobs that were coming in and just, just taking everything. So that's, let's stop there and um, take a deep breath. We're going to focus now on the solution. And definitely working on a problem reduces the fear of it. And really reducing fear is our job uh, now and for uh, the foreseeable future. And let's talk about how much time realistically, like, okay, so you're like going to grow your own food. Uh, how much time is it going to take? What can you produce? How much space is it going to take? And I want to assure you right away that it actually does not take that much time. In fact, ta-da! The short answer is you can grow about half of your own food in a backyard size space in less than an hour per day. Uh, and I actually, we uh, have done this for almost a decade now. I've taught actually literally hundreds of thousands of people. And I, I, I know personally of, of, of several ten thousands that in the grow network that are doing uh, this system or some form of this system. So let's get started. And believe me, I've spent years trying to figure out what is the most efficient and most productive and fastest and easiest. And the number one thing is going to be egg production. Uh, and the ingredients that you need for a backyard flock of laying hens is six laying hens. A rooster is optional. Uh, you're definitely going to need a predator uh, safe coop and run. Uh, you want some fencing for them to get out in the yard from time to time, chicken feed and feeding system, and then a watering system. Now, one laying hen produces about 250 eggs per year. She'll do that for several years, um, but that's a, that's a lot of eggs. And I recommend a flock of six laying hens that will produce about 1,500 eggs per year, six times, you know, 250. One medium-sized egg is about 63 calories. This is, by the way, this is my beautiful virtual personal assistant. She helps me with the numbers. <laughs> Anyway, 1,500 eggs is going to be 94,500 calories. I know that calories used to be a bad word. I promise you, the calorie is the new form of currency. Um, and I hope this comes across well. By the way, whenever you see any of the line drawings in here, and 
I'm not going to go into this story because I really want to move forward with um, more solution for you. But I wrote a book called The Grow System. There's a lovely, lovely story of a relationship that I had with a rooster there in the chapter on, on laying flocks. And, um, you know, I know we're talking about survival and calories and production, but there really is a whole relationship and spiritual level to which growing food uh, you'll you'll develop, and it's really delightful. So anyway, if you pick up a copy of the book, there's a wonderful story in there about Buddy the Rooster. Now, why do I recommend six hens? Um, because they're flocking creatures, and they depend on each other for security. Um, whoops, let me go back to that for just a second. Uh, so if you watch your flock of hens, every, everything likes to eat chicken, right? And um, the hens like to, you know, chickens, they peck on the ground for this and that and the other. And if you watch a flock, there will always be somebody with their head up looking around and then while the others have their head down and they kind of trade that duty off. And if you have six hens, then one is kind of doing, you know, security and the other five or her five friends can be eating and then they, they trade that off. If you have two hens, then half of the time, one of them has to be up. And if you have one hen, it's unbelievably cruel because then she's just terrified of, you know, pecking and hunting around and looking with, and then having to do security at the same time. So really recommend you get six. Yeah. Later on, get more, but you also just want to start small, uh, because we don't want to go crazy and, and, and a smaller flock is going to be a little bit easier to manage for you. And then again, those six hens are going to produce plenty of eggs. Uh, 1500 eggs is 365 every single day of the year. You'll have a three egg omelet. Plus you'll have 33 dozen eggs left over to barter and trade or do other things with. So six hens is a really good amount for a beginner. By the way, do not raise your first set of hens from baby chicks. I know it sounds all romantic. First of all, it takes um, hens about five or six months of age before they start laying. And raising chicks is it's a different skill set and requires different equipment um, from, from keeping laying hens. I will say it, it is a really delightful thing. I've done it uh, you know, many times, and it's especially wonderful homeschooling project if you've got small kids. But right now, you do not have six months uh, to do this, and you need to get up and going right away. So let's talk about how much uh, space this backyard flock of hens is going to take. Uh, a chicken coop and run actually fits in about the size of a parking spot. Um, here is a design for one that's 8 foot by 16 feet. Uh, it's 126 square feet. Let me give you a bigger drawing. And again, this book, this is in the in the Grow System book. Um, these dimensions, and this is a very good size. These hens will be very comfortable. They have an outdoor run, and every now and then you're going to want to let them loose in the yard to, to do things, but this, this is a very wonderful coop and run for them that is also very secure. This can be something you can build in a weekend, maybe two weekends. By the way, I just want to set your expectations that you will lose chickens, right? Those Everything likes to eat chicken, bobcat, raccoon, raccoon coyote, weasel, you know, everything, loves chick hawks, right? And those predators have all night, every night to find holes in your coop design and inevitably they will. So I just want to set you up emotionally to know that that's going to happen. Uh, in fact, you probably will have lots of losses in different areas. Uh, and one of the things about growing your own food is you, you come to a very different relationship and understanding of the whole circle of life, which includes death. Um, but, you know, uh, get, a, get, you know, get replacements, fix the holes and move on and learn. All right. So um, just want to set your emotional like thing like with that. By the way, feeding chickens, I really recommend you start buying chicken feed at the beginning. Right. You have so much else to learn. You got to build that coop. You're going to be starting new habits of looking in on the chickens and feeding them and, and watering them and stuff. Just buy the chicken feed. Right now, it's still, you know, cheap as chicken feed, right? Um, people ask me, what do I recommend? I really recommend the non-GMO, non-soy chicken feed. There is organic chicken feed. It usually is way more expensive. Definitely don't buy the cheap GMO chicken feed because then you're just, you know, you're just perpetuating the whole GMO thing. 
And I found most farmers, even if they don't have the organic uh, certification, if they're growing non-GMO, non-soy, which is probably going to be a local farmer or somebody regionally, they generally are using um, organic practices anyway. And you do get a, a little bit of a discount on the price of it. By the way, uh, you can come up with free chicken feed, entirely 100% free chicken feed. Um, but get to that later, right? Get this set up, get it running, get some of these other things going. Use what we have now to make your life easier. And if you recall in the email when you registered, we I sent you, I think it was five resources. And one of them was a movie, uh, freechickenfeed.com. It's really funny. My friend Justin Rhodes put this together. And it's how you can come up with a whole bunch of ways to feed your chickens for free. Watering is super important. You always want to have redundant watering systems. Um, I have spent a good bit, bit deal of time in central Texas and then also Colorado, which are extremely dry desert areas. And oh my goodness, to have something not have water is, is horrible. So I always have at least two. They're really simple to construct. I use one with a five gallon bucket and a float valve. And these are things that will be around post-collapse. There's lots of food valves in the back of every toilet. Here's a picture of um, me with, you can see this chicken in the front is drinking from, I had a little float valve in a little tub there. And the hose you can see behind me is actually connected up to that uh, blue 55 gallon drum, which is just to elevate a little bit. So this whole thing is gravity fed. And then off on the right side of the screen, there's a white five gallon drum. And then you'll see just way off to the very right, there's a piece of PVC pipe that I cut out. It has a flow float valve in it also. So I have two of them. By the way, this is a free range flock of chickens that I have. And there are many, many ways to keep chickens. As a beginner, I really recommend you do the keep coop and run. And then as your systems and skills develop, then, you know, explore other alternatives. But the coop and run is going to be the best way for a beginner to start. Oh, I wanted to mention one other thing. that You see that garbage can behind me? That is one of the best ways to store your feed. Um, it's just really good and rodent proof. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, plastic and things like that, they can chew through. Uh, so that's a really good way to store it. And that, that, that can right there would hold a good uh, 50 pounds of feed at least. Eggs, they're, they're superfoods. You, know, you got hard boiled eggs. Uh, that one on top there is my favorite breakfast. There's always fresh greens, no matter what, no matter where you live, you can always have fresh greens. And I, I love a couple of eggs on top of fresh greens every morning, a quiche, uh, deviled eggs, you're going to be, you'll be, everybody loves deviled eggs at the potluck, right? So, you know, lots of things to do with eggs. It is a wonderful superfood. And yes, you can keep chickens up in the north. Uh, here I am visiting a friend. This is in Utah. This was in December. Uh, I also, I do recommend, you can keep them up there. Their laying production is going to drop. And honestly, if you live far north, I would recommend ducks. Very, very similar concept, um, coop sizing and spacing. Um, actually, I think ducks are a little bit more of a prolific layers, um, uh, but they are, and they're a little bit better. They're more adapted to the colder weather. Uh, but either way, a backyard flock uh, with six uh, laying hens, whether they're, they're ducks or, or chickens. If the timing is right, then the next thing you're going to want to do is start a garden. And right now, throughout most of the the hemisphere, uh, northern hemisphere, we're getting ready for the timing to be right. It's absolutely perfect right now for more southern parts, Florida, Texas, Arizona. Uh, and you're starting to start starts in greenhouses if you're moving further north than that. Um, I really recommend you start with two raised beds that are 50 square foot each. And you'll, it's really astonishing how much you can produce in this. And it, it just doesn't take that much room to produce a lot. Um, buy the best quality soil that you can find. And let me see, where's the next thing? Uh, here, again, this is one of these long drawings from the book. This is an example. This is what it looks like. I like to do it two cinder blocks high. And then, so you can see the scale here of what it looks like, what two raised beds looks like. That the, Each bed there is 50 square feet. And here is the actual real world implementation. I grew in this garden uh, for a couple of years in Colorado. And um, 
hugely that those two beds right there produced in one season because that's all they have in Colorado it's pretty dang cold most of the year produced all of the vegetables that I needed and I mean I was freezing and canning and drying um, and produced all the produce that I needed for an entire year just out of those two 100 square foot beds in one growing season. Um, one of the other links that I sent to you in that email, by the way, if you haven't gotten those emails, please check your spam. I mean, I think it's such a bummer. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm the founder of the company. I'm, my own emails even end up in my own spam box. But anyway, um, Lynn Gillespie, who has been growing in raised beds like this for 35 years, uh, we did this uh, 33 episodes where we started right just with a yard with grass, built those two beds, and then just had huge harvests and a lot of fun along the way. And that was that link is also in the email I sent you, but it's also here at highperformancegardening.com. And, you know, go binge watch that sometime <laughs> instead of whatever Netflix has to offer you. My big regret is I wanted to have a helicopter in the in the show, but Lynn is like, Marjorie, that would destroy the garden anyway. Um, by the way, sitting on the cinder blocks, uh, you can also ra make raised beds that are are at you know at at um, standing height uh, for for people who or or wheelchair accessible. Um, but I actually just like the cinder blocks here because you can sit there, and you'll notice that you can reach into that bed anywhere. And uh, you know you know often I'm just sitting there and and doing it. So this is very good for people with less mobility uh, to be able to access this form of gardening. I want to give you a, a rough division of time for the garden processes. And I think the third part is going to shock you a little bit. So first of all, 40% of your effort is going to be in the planning, the bed prep, the planting. This is like at the beginning of each season. You're, you know, you're kind of working the bed a little bit. You're adding in some compost and maybe some other minerals and nutrients. And then you're planting in your transplants or you're working with your seeds. So about 40% of your effort is going to go there. About 20% is going to be in the watering there really isn't a lot of weeding, but, you know, a little bit of tending, you know, making sure you got, you know, everything's doing well. And then here's the shocker is really a large chunk of your time is going to be in harvesting and processing. I can't tell you how many people I've known and they are, they just totally underestimate, but you know, yeah, it takes time to pull up all those carrots and kind of clean them off and, you know, <laughs> get them sorted out and all that, or the tomatoes. So, that is the most enjoyable part though, right? And that's the time to bring the kids in. Oh my God, harvesting. They love it. All right, so the secret to a green thumb. Don't tell me you've killed everything. I started out that way. I started out with like the most blackest thumb anybody has ever had. And the real secret to it is great soil. Uh, so you're going to definitely need to keep have soil to keep the, the soil fertility up. Uh, this is a pretty traditional... Uh, you know, compost bin on one side, you got it active where you're adding stuff. And the other side is where it's just sort of sit, sitting there and mellowing out and doing its thing. By the way, this is uh, an approximately 100 square foot bed that I had when I was homesteading in Texas. And those six five gallon buckets of compost are approximately what you need to add each, you know, each growing season to give you an idea of how much compost you need. Um, Per garden bed. So you do need to be very active about making compost. It's very important. By the way, one of the other items that I sent you in that email is compost the movie. <laughs> How to compost anything, even your enemies. This is a video that David the Good, he's a wonderful, wonderful survival gardener, real friend of the Grow Network, a big part of our organization. And um, <laughs> you can see that video at funnycompostmovie.com. There are a gazillion ways to compost. And, you know, maybe someday I'll need to do a whole webinar on just on how to compost. But go watch that movie. It's super inspiring. David is definitely a, a more liberal composter, which I hope that doesn't, that doesn't translate into politics. So don't worry about it. Um, here's what you can produce in that 100 square foot garden just to set your expectations. The most calorically dense food in a garden is going to be potatoes in about four months in a hundred square feet. You can grow about a hundred pounds and that is going to be about 51,000 calories. Here I am in front of a harvest of a hundred pounds of potatoes. And those two potatoes that I have in my hands weigh exactly one pound. So for me, 
a half a pound of potato is a good serving size and a hundred pounds of potato is about 200 servings. So, you know, that's like every other day of the year you're eating, uh, you know, you get a serving of potato, which is a, a pretty good, um, you know, it's a pretty good thing. Green beans, uh, not as calorically dense, but delightful, 7,200 calories. I, I really like, by the way, I really like these long ones. They withstand the heat really well, especially in the South. Tomatoes in four months, uh, 82,000, I'm sorry, 8,200 calories. That, by the way, is enough to make 33 pints of very thick tomato sauce. Oh my God, that's why we do it. And I'm not talking about that runny, thin stuff at the grocery store. I'm talking about thick tomato sauce. You can grow um, 8,400 calories of yellow squash. If you grow 100 square feet of yellow squash, everybody will hate you because you will have so much squash. You'll be giving it away to people. Actually, really, there's a funny gardener joke about how when you have like more than three squash plants, you'll be taking bags of squash and running to somebody's house, putting it on the front door, ringing the doorbell and running away. <laughs> Those happen. By the way, this one year I grew the zucchini and I'll be doggone, that thing hid. I, I can, I check the garden every day and, and that thing hid from me. And I, when I found it, I was like, oh my God. And you know what? That thing was still delicious, even at that size. I mean, I ate off of that zucchini for the longest time. Uh, carrots, 17,600 calories in four months in a hundred square feet. Um, by the way, on carrots, you can, you can eat the tops as well as the roots. I really love to make a wonderful, wonderful carrot pesto with that. So, you know, olive oil and carrot tops and garlic, by the way. So the numbers that I've been presenting to you here are if you're a beginning gardener and as your skills develop, you can double or triple, or even in some cases grow five times to even 10 times as much. I've seen some people doing like going vertical and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. It's incredible what you can grow in a hundred square feet. By the way, strawberries, five months, 5,760 calories. <laughs> You're yummy. Sweet potatoes. Uh, this is a really good alternative in the Southern states, whereas the Irish potatoes are better in the Northern states in four months. 33,538 calories. These guys love the heat. So you can grow these in the, in the Texas summer, the Arizona summer, all summer long. Sweet potato fries. Yes, I am definitely a woman of the South. I love sweet potato fries. So realistically, um, you know, from a hundred square foot garden in one to two growing seasons, you can get anywhere 20,000 to 60,000 calories. Super, super nutritious. So now let's get on to the third part of this system. By the way, this is only a three component system and I recommend everybody start with these basic three. Uh, the best source of backyard calories and nutrition is going to be a rabbit tree. And I recommend that you have four breeders, uh, one buck and three breeding does. A doe will have approximately eight babies per kindle. A, a kindle was like a litter, right? Uh, they can be bred three to four times a year. Commercial rabbit trees breed them a lot more frequently. I, I don't want to do that. That's kind of harsh on the bucks. I mean, I'm sorry, on the does. So I do it three to four times. Also in climates like Texas, which get really, really hot in the summer, um, you're not going to be able to breed in the summer. They, they just, nobody wants to be pregnant in the summer in Texas. <laughs> anyway, three does can produce like, you know, 75 rabbits a year. And um, I tend to harvest mine older. You really can harvest them in about three months, but I, I tend to, well, I procrastinate on butchering, let's face it. But the other thing is I do like them to get fat because I really uh, value and appreciate the fat. Uh, and the harvest weight on mine are generally heavier than what you might do, uh, than what they do in the commercial rabbitry, about seven pounds. You're gonna get about a 50% meat to carcass ratio is what we call it. You get about three and a half pounds of meat out of this rabbit. Plus, you're going to get the organs, the bones, and the hides. Each breeder would get a hutch, approximately 10 to 12 square feet uh, a piece. They would love more, and it would be wonderful to give them more if you've got it. This is an example of where my breeders are. Uh, this is a, a, a hutch that I made. It's two and a half feet wide by 20 feet long, and it, each breeder has their own cage there. Um, 
once the babies are weaned, I move them to what we call tractors, which sounds all glamorous, but you don't actually drive anything. <laughs> You're the engine. Uh, I found that a three foot by eight foot tractor is a very good size and they can be made very, very lightweight so that a woman or a child can pull this easily. Uh, they're only about 24 square feet per tractor. And what you're doing is you're dragging this thing along the ground and the bunnies can eat the grasses and the forbs. They're also going to be pooping there. Um, and you're going to have your, your weed and feed basically automatic. And the more seasons that you have these rabbits going over this ground, the more fertile it's going to get and the more abundant it's going to get and the, and the better forage that you're going to be getting for all your future uh, rabbits that you run over it. You'll need three tractors for the babies, which is a total of about uh, 72 square feet for the, for the three different tractors. Here's another design. So the four breeders in a 50 square foot, um, you know, hutch system, and then the three tractors. I mean, we're really, again, we're only talking about the size of a parking space. One pound of rabbit meat, almost 900 calories, 893. If you're getting 75 rabbits with three and a half pounds each, that is a whopping 234,000 calories. Um, and 75 rabbits, a rabbit is, uh, let me go back, a rabbit is very, very equivalent to a chicken. And so what we're talking about is basically a chicken and a, you know, a, a rabbit and a half every week. Uh, and if you do the math on that, the, um, that is enough protein for a family of four uh, with this one small rabbit tree. Again, as with the chickens, I really, really recommend you start out just buying rabbit pellets for your feed. I, it's just so much easier. You've got so much else to learn. You're going to need to learn about your bucks and your does and setting up breeding schedules and checking on them and learning about rabbits. You, you know, and of course you built the hutches and the, and then you'll be building the, the little rabbit tractors. You've got a lot to learn. So just, you know, uh, buy the pellets and make your life a lot easier. Also set up one of those gravity fed watering systems so that, you know, again, that's a very simple chore and it doesn't take a lot of time. Um, and again, rabbits are herbivores. They love garden weeds, landscape trimmings, fruit tree printings, and just like the chickens, it's actually fairly easy to get um, to, to be able to feed them without buying anything. But in the beginning, start out and buy feed. So that way, you know, you, step by step, right? Let's go step by step. And it really is important to think about being able to buy, you know, to, to do these systems without feed, because when the grocery stores are shut down, the feed stores are going to be shut down too, right? It's not like you're going to be able to go buy rabbit feed if the grocery store is shut. So we have to think about that. By the way, my rabbit tree underneath of it, the pellets would just drop right through. And that was a compost pile. I had that right next to my garden and I would just take a pitchfork and sling it over into the garden. <laughs> You know, even if we didn't have this uh, uh, this crisis that we're just uh, beginning, your health and your life actually really depends on backyard food production because, you know, we used to say, oh, be a perimeter shopper. Actually, there's nothing in the perimeter either. There is no nutrition really of any significance in the grocery store. This is a wonderful chart put together by a friend of mine, August Dunning. This is also in the book, by the way, and it just shows over the decades the absolute plummet of nutritional content in the commercial food supply, and then the skyrocketing levels of disease. It's very clear. I mean, there, there's probably multiple causes of disease, but absolutely one of the foundations is malnutrition. And people don't like to think of like, you know, Americans being malnourished, but we absolutely are. By the way, speaking of nutrition, and I know this is not gonna thrill some of you, uh, but the liver, the kidneys, and the heart, and the bones, uh, especially from the rabbits, super nutrition. The most nutritionally dense thing um, is liver. And I know you're not thrilled about liver. Believe me, I have learned how to sneak liver. I have two kids. <laughs> I've learned how to sneak liver and everything. Um, but ounce for ounce, like, 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 just take a look at this. Like, uh, well, first it's protein, of course, but vitamin A, all the B vitamins, iron, all the kinds of trace elements, 
and then this COQ10. I mean, there's, there's all, it's just like you aren't going to need a one a day when you start eating liver. And um, if you're my age and older, you remember when you're, you know, I remember when my mother made us eat liver once a week. I will not say that I like that, but I have learned, you know, make it into a liver pate. We actually have a, a really good uh, forum thread going on at the, at the Grow Network of how to eat organ meats. Judson Carroll posted something there also about how to eat like all these crazy animals that you find like in beaver or whatever. But anyway, there are lots of ways to make this stuff uh, delicious. So by the way, I would never eat organ meat from animals raised in a commercial food system uh, because, you know, a lot of these organs are, you know, a filtration processes and, you know, they, they just are in a very toxic environment, but something that you're growing yourself and you know exactly what that animal ate, it's definitely going to be safe and super nutritious. By the way, another bonus is you simmer the bones and the eggs and you make these broths, which are rich in calcium and magnesium and phosphorus. Um, when I was a young woman, I remember, you know, getting out of the house and going to college and my soups never tasted like my mom's soups. And, um, she always had a stock pot on the back of the stove where she was throwing in bones and, you know, chunks of the broccoli that we didn't use. And she always had these broths and the whole difference between a good tasting soup and not was having that broth going. So it took me a while to learn that. <laughs> Everything, every recipe that you have for your chicken is completely and directly translatable into rabbit. So you can roast it, you can fry it, you can stir fry it. Uh, anything you can do with chicken, you can do with rabbit. I have often served rabbit to people, forgot to mention to them, and they just assumed it was chicken. So um, they're great. So I just want to point out this three component system. It has greater than 365,000 calories, and that's 1,000 calories a day for 365 days a year, which is about half the diet, um, you know, that you need. Uh, you probably really need a little bit more, but, you know, if you can generate, you know, generating 365,000 calories, which is, is half of a diet, is pretty dang good, and it really just doesn't take that much time to operate these systems, especially when you have those automatic water set up. Uh, and you set up your systems to be so simple. Now notice that this system does not require refrigeration or electricity, right? You're not refrigerating anything. You're going and harvesting a rabbit right when you need it. Uh, you're pulling vegetables fresh. You're pulling eggs fresh. So this is a completely off-grid system. And I have taught this to kids. Uh, here I am with a, uh, a bunch of school kids. And then uh, I've taught this to elders. Uh, there are people everywhere that are doing this system. Um, actually, that's my friend Bonnie, and we were, she has a really bad back, so we were talking about different tools that she could use without having to bend over. Um, by the way, there are many, many, many ways to grow, produce food, and I'll get into more of them here in a bit. But I really recommend, as a beginner, Start out with a flock of laying hens, raised bed gardens, and a rabbitry. There's just the fastest and easiest, best production methods for a beginner. And there are a zillion other things, but these are going to be the easiest that you can do with the most accessible materials around, right? So this is the best way to get started. So the plan, right now, start your flock of laying hens. You can do that any time of year, anywhere. So even if it's in the middle of winter, you can do that. Uh, when the season is right, start your garden. And then the rabbitry can also be done anytime. But since the butchering is a little daunting for be beginners, you might want to do that as your, your third component. Uh, but then the fun really begins. So, you know, beekeeping, mushrooms, and by the way, <laughs> the culinary kinds grew about the same as the psychedelic, just saying, you know, <laughs> uh, cannabis. Um, yeah. Now that that's like legal and we don't have to do it illegally anymore. Um, <laughs> um, it's a great trade item, goats, uh, ducks and, uh, for eggs and meat. Greenhouses are another thing that you're going to want to do, uh, foraging. So wild foods, uh, you know, there's just, uh, there are lots and lots and lots of ways to produce a lot of food. And growing food also just really generates community, which is another huge 
uh, benefit of the whole thing. This is a wonderful community garden right here. That's a lot of fun. So there's healing on many levels with this. I really, I know, you know, we're, we're all freaked out because the world is changing really fast and things that we are used to and comfortable and have been convenient for us are disappearing. But there's so much healing for this. First of all, on the physical level, it's just really deep nutrition, the gentle exercise, the you know, sunlight. You, I can't, I cannot believe the condition and shape I am. I'm, I'm 59 as we're recording this. And I feel as strong and as good as I was when I was a teenager. Uh, you know, I've just, um, I'm just about to test for my brown belt and karate. Um, anyway, I feel great. Mentally, uh, people who eat higher quality food score higher on intelligence tests. Bottom line, you will start to think more clearly when you're starting to eat better. Emotionally, you know, not having to worry about whether that grocery store is open or not, or whether your kids are going to go hungry, or whether the supply chain breaks, or hyperinflation. I mean, emotionally, this will heal you. And then spiritually, you're, you're working directly with the forces of creation. And we're not getting it into it in this presentation, but we, uh, mystical things happen, magical things happen. It really gets incredible and wonderful. And I'll just tease you with that for now. But, you know, get started going with it. And, and, and you'll see in a, in a couple of years, you'll go, oh, my gosh, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. And the other detail is, is you're highly unlikely to live through this decade without growing your own food. So <laughs> you really should do it. Um, I also have another thing that's been fascinating. And is if you do live through this decade, you're actually likely to live over 150 years old. So I, I uh, used to host a uh, annual summit where we had all kinds of speakers and presenters on growing food and backyard food production. And one year, the keynote speaker was this gentleman here, Dave Asprey, who is, he's considered the father of modern, modern biohacking, leads a large community of people that um, Dave himself has a stated objective to live to 180 years old. And Oh my gosh, there's so much, you know, neuroscience and nootropics and all kinds of, you know, EMF tables and uh, thermogenics and, and, and I don't know, NA2 injections. I mean, there's so much stuff they're developing, uh, telomere extension drugs. There's so much they're developing for life extension. And we are in such a time of accelerating medical um, knowledge that, uh, I, I went to one of their biohacking conferences uh, last year, and the, the common understanding was is they are really just on the breakthrough of being able to not only in, extend your life, but also to decrease your biological age. So if your current age is, you know, mine 59, that they can reduce that to where I would ultimately have the, the life, you know. Anyway, you might wonder why a guy like Dave Asprey is at, you know, this biohacking guy with all this high tech, super duper, you know, cutting edge science stuff would be at a humble, you know, homegrown food summit. Well, almost every centenarian ever interviewed had either grew their own food, or either grew their own food or had access to homegrown food throughout their life. And it is a foundation for health and longevity. And Dave himself has a 15 acre homestead where he grows all of his own meats and vegetables and most of his own fruits. And he is a huge proponent of backyard food production to his community because that is primarily the only way you're gonna get the, the nutrient density that your body absolutely needs. So, wow, you know, like living to 150, that's kind of mind blowing, but I really believe that's possible. You're gonna have to get through this decade. <laughs> Okay, so we're coming up on the most popular part of the class, and that's going to be the Q&A section. I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions, and um, Jimerson's going to be, help me moderate these, uh, but I'm going to give you a, sh while you're getting that together, I'm going to give you a short story of how I got into this, so I think I'd mentioned this on some of the interviews. So I used to be a, starboard, a student of Robert Kiyosaki. Um, here I am. My business was so successful. He used me as a testimonial on his Time Life infomercials uh, for selling the Rich Dad, Poor Dad program. So I was on national television for like four years. Um, 
and then I uh, was volunteering on this program at Red Rock Elementary School. And the bottom line was I realized this is in Central Texas. Uh, TOFCA is the Texas Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. And we realized that there was not enough locally grown food in all of the county to provide part of the vegetables. And it just shook me to the core. Uh, I just I just could not believe that, you know, all the Willie Nelson concerts to save the family farm had not worked. So I went full. I, I actually sold the business, uh, the real estate business, because, um, you know, making money is just not important. When I realized that learning how to grow food would be the most important thing at some point in time, and I would need to learn how to do that. And then we would have to teach other people because there would be a crisis at some point in time. And here we are. So anyway, I learned a lot. I didn't know anything when I started, by the way. If you feel bad about killing things, <laughs> I can tell you stories. Uh, and I started teaching. Here I am at some prepper festival. This is my daughter, Kimber. You know, she was homeschooled, so she would travel with me to like Mother Earth news fairs and stuff. So cute. She's almost 21 now. Um, oh, by the way, don't you love those suspenders? <laughs> uh, and uh, then we developed the, the Grow Network. And, um, the, you know, we have a, a blog and a forums. We have a, a store. We have an academy. Um, you know, we, we've been doing a lot with media. This is the Grow Network team, by the way. Uh, actually, I think this photo is a little outdated, but I just want to let you know we're just a dedicated group of people. We are not anything too fancy. And by the way, there's Jimerson over on the left. Hi, Jimerson. Looking badass in those sunglasses, isn't he? Anyway, um, you know, that that's us. We're just a dedicated team. There's about eight of us uh, that work really, really hard. Um, whoops. Oh, yeah. Here's some of the media stuff. Isn't that fun? <laughs> Bad glamour shots in a garden. Oh God, that's so hilarious. I wrote the book, The Grow System. This is a picture of the book. And I do want to make you an offer. And I'm going to go hop over for a second to show you the academy real quick. And then we're going to get to your questions. So Super J, let me see if I can figure this out. How do I do this? Da -dum -da -dum. Um, or is it, let me get it. Okay. I think I, I was practicing this. Okay. Super J, is this screen showing up now for everybody? It is now. Okay, great. So this is the Grow Network Academy. And uh, this is something that I have been spending years putting together. And these are a whole bunch of certifications that we have. Um, growing edible mushrooms, exploring botany. Here's a weekend project on making a worm bin, uh, raising backyard sheep. Uh, here's another weekend project, verma, vermicomposting. That's a really fancy word for worm farming. <laughs> uh, saving quality, you know, saving seeds, building greenhouses. Uh, the grow system is the grow half thing, which I've just sketched for you here. Uh, backyard chickens. Here's a weekend project on making that off-grid watering system I talked to you about. Uh, Biointensive gardening is the type of gardening I recommend in the raised beds. Um, backyard uh, rabbits, meat rabbits, uh, nutrient-dense soil, and how to make compost, and how to have really good soil, um, backyard meat ducks, using goats, uh, the Instant Master Gardener. If you're really just starting out, I recommend that one. It's short and it's fast. It's super empowering. You're going to feel great when you do that. We, have, we do have some other medical stuff, so weekend projects, essential oils, um, making bitters, really good for digestive um, cultivating cannabis, making herbal medicine, conquering sugar. Eating sugar is a huge problem. You're going to ramp up your health dramatically when you conquer sugar. Uh, home medicine, herbal energetics, um, pressure canning, water bath canning, wild crafting and foraging. And let me go show you what one certification looks like. And we'll go over to the backyard duck, uh, backyard chickens, the flock. And here it is. Uh, and so you're going to have some modules here. It looks like this one's about eight. And uh, let's just pick one of them to go look at. Um, by the way, the presenter here is Tasha Greer. Uh, she's a friend of mine. A lot of these presenters, I have been to their homesteads and verified that they are the real deal. She's amazing. She lives in uh, North Carolina. And when you go there, a little bit of homework for you. 
There will also be a bunch of extra resources. For example, um, there's an extra video in here on different types of chicken breeds and what chicken breeds are going to be best for you in your uh, in your region. There are references, and then there's also a quiz. Where is the quiz? Okay. And the quiz, I told the presenters, like, look, make the quiz kind of easy. Oh, it's not showing up for me. Oh, here, to start the quiz. You know, make it kind of easy. Don't make it too hard. Don't make it too easy. When you're watching that video, if you know there's going to be a quiz, it's for you. The quiz is for you because it makes you pay more attention <laughs> to what you're doing, right? And then the fun thing is, is we, we if you, you know, when you complete a, when you complete a, um, certification will give you a badge and, 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 you know, it, it's kind of a little thing. You get to pr print something out. By the way, the, um, what comes with the academy is also our forums and our forums are actually free, but we have seven moderators and we have about a hundred street team members. And these are dedicated homesteaders that have been living this lifestyle, a lot of them for decades. And you can ask any question you want. And there will be a thread on it. And I promise you within just a very short time, you can ask anything like how often do I collect eggs or, you know, uh, what's the best way to store chestnuts or, you know, I'm terrified of a pressure cooker. <laughs> can you help me? Right. Um, we, uh, you know, the, the answer, the, it'll be right here in this 24 seven, by the way, we our, our moderators and our street team are from all over the world. Uh, so there is going to be somebody in your bioregion that will know exactly what's going on, regardless if you live in a desert or high up on a mountain or in the tropics. So um, the the um, let me see if I can do this again. Super J, let me go back to the slide presentation. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, webinar offer. Use current slide. So we're offering the um, we've got a book thing with the 23 certifications. By the way, these are all downloadable because you and I both know the grid is going to go down at some point in time, right? We also have a huge library with downloadable ebooks uh, and the forums. And then it also includes a physical copy of the book, which is a 288 page book. And the book covers, um, um, actually it's less than 82 cents. We just lowered the price for this special. It's, it's $200 now for web webinar participants, I got to change this slide, um, which is actually, I don't know, it's 62 cents a day. Anyway, uh, it's at 123growfood.com. And uh, that's a that's a special for this. Now let's get over. I'm going to hop back over to our thing. And Super J, am I back in thing? You, are you there? Yeah, we can't see your slides. You want to try sharing your slides again? No, no, it's just us because we're okay. going to answer questions now. Yeah. Perfect. So. Okay. Well, we've All got right. tons of questions, and I don't think we're going to get uh, have enough time to get everybody's, but we can do our best. We will do our best. <laughs> um, earlier in the presentation, you were you were asking or you were talking about stocking up on food, and a bunch of people mm -hmm. started asking, "What is the best kind of food to stock up on?" You know, the, it used to be the golden rule of stocking up on food was stock up on food that you eat, right? <laughs> you know, then that is the best thing, right? You know, like, uh, but I have begun to violate that a little bit personally. Honestly, we are headed into such a very difficult period that I recommend stocking up on any kind of food that condenses well and has a, I don't think anything's ever going to live through its shelf life at this point in time, because I think things are going to get eaten up pretty quickly. Grains and beans are the most calorically dense and easy to acquire and store foods. Uh, I like a lot of other canned meats, like I've been stocking up on tuna fish and things like that. By the way, the hardest thing to grow in your backyard is going to be fat and then protein is going to be the most difficult thing. So uh, the things I've been storing up for fat is um, coconut milk. You know, those cans of coconut milk, there's a lot of fat in that. And depending on when you get it, you can have an expiration date of one to two years. I've heard about places where you can buy duck fat in a can. I'm trying to find that. Um, fats, unfortunately, like oils and things, uh, tend to go rancid pretty quickly. The coconut oil does last longer. Um, you know, the most cost-effective foods are going to be beans and, and rice and wheat. 
I honestly don't eat weed. Like I'm a little bit sensitive to it, but I am stocking up on it because I can use it to trade with somebody else, right? So even if it's food that you don't eat, you, it's valuable. So, um, and my recommendation is get two years worth, <laughs> at least. <laughs> All right. Um, so we had some people wonder, including Janice, uh, what to do if you run out of that chicken feed. Yeah, well, that's why we have that video on, on how to provide chicken feed for your chickens. And there's a lot of things you can do. There's, there's a lot of waste around, like, you know, you brewers, you can go get used brewery grain. A lot of people will do things like plant a mulberry tree in their chicken yard. And then when the mulberries drop, the, the chickens love to eat the mulberries. Uh, they definitely eat all kinds of scraps. Uh, definitely watch the video that we provided on uh, how to provide 100% of your chicken feed for free to get a bunch of really good ideas on how to feed your chicken feeds. Uh, another possibility is, um, and this might be a little bit gross, but you know, insects, growing your own wind, insects, uh, black soldier flies, larva is a traditional one that's that's pretty easy to grow. And, I, and here's the gross part is, you know, if I found roadkill that was beyond what I would want to eat, um, just let the maggots grow in that meat. And those chickens love those maggots. So, I mean, there's, I know that's kind of gross, but there are lots and lots of ways to do this. And we need to all start thinking out of the box. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a uh, Jason, I believe ask, uh, he's from North Dakota wants to know if this is for everyone. I, I think this is a temperature weather related question. It sounds like a guy from North Dakota. Hi Jason. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> Yes, this is for everybody. As I said, the Grow Network, we actually are a global community. I mean, a lot of it is North American, so so sorry, but we, we have a, a, it really is a global organization. We actually have a lot of Canadians, our, uh, folks from Ireland I was just communicating with. Yes, and you know, that's one of the reasons, gosh, was, there was the certification in there on how to build greenhouses, um, you know, and as I was talking about, you know, ducks are going to be a better bird for you further north than than chickens. Uh, this absolutely is for everybody. All right. Brian in Texas asks, what is the best homemade fertilizer? Ah, you know what is the best? So there's a woman named Dr. Elaine Ingram, who I really had the honor of getting to study with for quite a while. And she is called the diva of soil microbiology. I don't know if that's an official name or if it's just something I gave her, but He's a total brainiac about soil and soil microorganisms and mineral transfer. And um, she looks at things with a microscope. And compost, worm compost, huge, the, by, hands down, the best uh, fertilizer for your gardens. And it's one of the reasons I emphasize worm farming so much. And you can do worm farming uh, anywhere. So um, that you can definitely do that up north. You may want to put it in a garage or a semi-warmer place, but you can definitely do warm farming everywhere. We've had, we've had about 100 to 200 different people ask some form of this question. Uh, uh, apartment dwellers and people with tiny, tiny backyards, what can they do? <laughs> yes, I, I know we're going to get that question. So let me give you a list of things. One is, so that mushroom certification, right? You can grow mushrooms indoors. Uh, you can grow herbs on windowsills. You can grow sprouts inside. Um, you, you may not be interested in this. There's a whole forum thread we recently had on growing snails <laughs> indoors, which by, the French call it escargot, and it becomes very expensive whenever you put a French name on it. Uh, you can actually grow quail indoors, and they'll produce you know, quail eggs, and then the quail themselves are edible. And... Um, in an apartment. I've had people growing um, rabbits in an apartment, which is a little bit interesting. And then you grow the fodder for the rabbits indoors. Another option, of course, is some of the balcony stuff. And we are working on a certification right now to get a growing in small spaces certification put into the academy. By the way, we, we update the academy almost every quarter with a brand new certification. And if you have ideas of what you need to see, please definitely ping me in the forums. I meant to tell you how to communicate with me. That's just anywhere in the forums, just do at Marjorie Wildcraft. And I read every comment and I do my best to respond to most of them. So um, definitely reach out to me. We're a community, right? Um, 
The other thing I really, really recommend is start a community garden. And uh, I'm actually in that process right now. I've been moving from Colorado to Puerto Rico. And when I got to Puerto Rico, I've been living in an apartment myself and it sucked. And I did two things. One is I started a garden. It's a gorilla garden. So I just basically found a piece of public land that nobody was using. And I grew a garden on it, <laughs> which who knows whether that's legal or not. But I got a lot of tomatoes and squash. So I'm not in basil, <laughs> whatever. And I met some other people who were doing the same thing. But then the other thing is I found a six acre tract of land and I've been going through this whole process and I'm working with the city municipality to make a community garden. And that that's a big one. It'll have like 380 garden plots. And here's why that's a really good thing. You may not have to have it that big, but um, using that example, if you can imagine, let's say you know nothing about gardening or growing food. But if you can imagine in one season what you'll learn from having 300 garden gardeners all, you know, trying different stuff, different seeds, different techniques, different fertilizers, what you, what you can learn in one season. And uh, a community garden, the other real benefit of a community garden is um, a, a few years ago, I got into martial arts, right? You know, like, boom, right? Like I said, I'm about to test for my brown belt here in a little while. And the biggest surprise from that was not the fitness or the karate. The biggest surprise from that was the relationships that got built because I train with these same people three times a week. And we're all in these god awful, ugly karate geese. And we don't know what we each other does for a living or anything. We're just coming there because we love the sport of karate and we bond on that way. The relationships and the, the sense of family from working to get, you know, from training together uh, all, you know, week after week and month after year after year. Right. And the same thing will happen in a community garden when you're growing food and you're meeting the same people day after day and you're meeting the coolest people in your neighborhood, because these are people who are not afraid of working or getting dirty and they're actually producing something useful. Right. So start a community garden. I I'm really excited about that. I need to make a cert on that myself. Super J. So there is a lot you can do uh, if you live in an apartment or condominium. All right. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions about just general food preservation. How do you go about preserving your food? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, there's lots of ways, uh, especially if you live in a drier climate, just dry it out, right? Dehydrate it. Uh, if you're in a northern climate, freezing it is great. I had a girlfriend of mine try to convince me to live one time in this crazy, crazy cold place up in the north. And she said, Marjorie, you'll never have to refrigerate anything. You just throw it on the porch. <laughs> um, as I'd mentioned in the academy, we do have the pressure canning uh, certification and we have the hot water canning certification. Um, there's all kinds of techniques for dehydration and smoke houses. Actually, I was very surprised to find in South Texas, my father-in-law, um, when I was married, grew up south of San Antonio, and he told me always as a boy, they had a smokehouse. They could even keep meat cured in a smokehouse, even in that warm of a climate down there. So that's another option. And again, there are a lot of resources on the Grow Network for that, either blog posts or forum threads. So um, absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot. And you do need to store food. All right, Mrs. Anderson from Portland asks, what about vegetarians and vegans? I completely hear you. Um, I know that that's a huge trend right now, the beyond meat and all that. I actually was a raw vegan when I, uh, when I started this process and I honestly, you know, you butchering rabbits is not like, I'm not like, it's not like, you know, it's terrible, right? Um, you've seen the numbers. A home rabbitry is the same space as a garden. It produces 234,000 calories. The backyard flock of chickens, which produces eggs, is 94,000 calories. The garden, which is the same space, really only produces 30 to 60,000 calories. I believe you need all three. I actually think you should have like five or six different food so sources being grown in your yard. And the, the really hard reality is that animal products are... Uh, much more calorically dense and easier to grow than um, uh, plant-based products. 
Uh, Andy's asking, uh, do you think that the famine is engineered? You know, yes, I do. I mean, uh, you know, I talked about the, um, the food chain reaction uh, scenario. I mean, we really are falling in line with that. And a lot of things they're doing just doesn't make any sense, like unless you are thinking that it was engineered. But Andy, I want to let you know, the GROW Network, we're non-political, we're non-religious, and we're non-dietary. I mean, really, we do have a lot of vegans, to go back to that other question. But we don't talk about politics, and we don't argue about it, and we don't worry about it. And from my perspective, whether it's engineered or not, it doesn't matter. It's happening, and it's out of my control. What's in my control is that I can grow my own food and start taking care of my community. So, you know, yeah, I do believe it's engineered, but, you know, at the end of the day, is that significant or not? Uh, I don't know. I also want to let everybody know, uh, when you come to the Grow Network, we really don't tolerate a whole lot of, you know, just don't post all that. There's lots of other places to post what's going on. We only really want to focus on the solutions of how do you grow food? How do you make medicine? You know, how do you stay warm? How do you take care of yourself? That we're really just focused on solutions. So, um, yeah, thanks for asking. And I know that a lot of people are very aware that 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 there's all kinds of stories of why this is all occurring. And I love conspiracy theories, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> the the Grow Network is just focused on solutions. Awesome. Uh, Kate or Katie wants to know uh, what they can do if they need to make their soil better right now without having to wait for a compost. Um, all right, Katie, uh, um, your own urine is going to be a really quick one. Uh, so your urine, uh, the, the three big elements that most plants want is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium and your own urine, depending on how much protein you've eaten, but in general, it's around 18% of highly plant available nitrogen. Uh, and you dilute that 10 to one. The way I did it, uh, usually do it, is just out the back door. I would have like a five-gallon bucket with a lid on it and just pee in that and, you know, just dilute it 10 to 1. Apply it to the soil, not necessarily to the plants. And, of course, as you're getting ready to harvest, you're not going to be applying it, right? You're going to water <laughs> it and let some rain go on it, clean it off. But um, it's a fantastic fertilizer. A friend of mine, one of the gardening teachers that I used to bring into my community all the time, used to grow the most amazing plant starts. I mean, she just had the most beautiful little tomato starts and pepper and basil. And I'd like, Nancy, how are you doing that? And she says, diluted urine. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So that's one that you can do immediately. And then, you know, if you want to buy some stuff, seaweed is fantastic. Fish emulsion is fantastic. Longer term, I would recommend azomite, which is a ground up mineral that you just add to your soil that will slowly break down and add minerals. Um, and then almost any kind of mulch or leaves or straw that you can put on top to cover the soil and let that begin to decompose while your plants are growing is another fantastic thing. But that's also the reason we have that whole um, uh, soil uh, certification. And believe me, the 50 free fertilizers in that ebook that I, I sent you in the first email that comes out, you know, flip through that, you'll find some good ones. All right. Um, we had a lot of people, Tamara and others, ask, what about goats? Yeah, I love goats. Uh, I, well, I personally don't want to have goats, honestly. Uh, there's a difference between goat people and cattle people, and goats are like really high, strong, and cattle are more mellow. But uh, yeah, we have a whole certification in there for how to have goats. We have another one for keeping sheep. Um, in Texas, and I, I'm referring that because I spent 20 years homesteading there. I've spent time in Colorado. I've also spent time in the tropics and I've traveled all over, and, and then also in Oregon. So I've lived in lots of different places to grow food, to understand different bioregions. And goats are, and, and one of the principles, by the way, of what's going to work well where is to look at what historically was there. Uh, and goats historically like dry, kind of harsh climates. Uh, and actually, I think goats are a much better, better animal for the Texas landscape than cattle are. Um, they're, they're great animals. You eat milk, meat, um, you know, <laughs> if 
You definitely need good fencing. One of the reasons the goats and I didn't get along is I didn't have good fencing and they got out and I have a lot of edible landscaping and the goats were competing with me for my edible landscaping. <laughs> I was not happy. Like you ate that. <laughs> Dang, you know, right. So, uh, yeah, by the way, um, you know, what was one of the best things instead of having goats is I had a neighbor who had goats and people ask me, do you have bees? And I'm like, no, I got something better. I said, I got a neighbor who has bees. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what community is all about. Exactly. Uh, all right, we got about two more questions. Time for two more questions. Jay asks if a woman with arthritis can do this on her own. I've really done my best to design these systems uh, to where you can do that. Um, you may need some help. And also, I would recommend you go into the forums and ask uh, what type of herbal medicines can you use or what type of things can you do to help work on your arthritis? You know, how can you reduce the inflammation in your body? Or, you know, maybe some of the calendula salves or CBD salves that would help relieve the pain or stress in the arthritis. So there's lots of ways that you can actually heal the arthritis. And then, yes, you know, of course, um, as I pointed out with the, the garden beds, we try to make them so you don't have to be bending over or squatting a lot. Uh, and most of the systems I've talked about here, they can be built for a small child or a woman. Um, to be able to, even the, even the garden beds, a, a one cinder block is 16 pounds, right? And most women and children can carry that. And you can build those blocks, those, those raised beds your, yourself. So, um, and I'd really encourage you to, there's, there's a lot you can do for arthritis and, and jump into the forums and ask, or, or check some of already, some of our other threads. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yep. Um, we got about time for one more question. I do want to apologize to all the people who are asking great questions in the chat there. Um, if we didn't get to your question, please go to the forums and ask it. If uh, one of us don't answer it, somebody will. We've got a lot of knowledgeable people in there. Uh, finally, the last question, uh, Michaela asks, uh, how do you sneak organ meat into the food? Yay! Thank you, Michaela. <laughs> how are you doing there? Oh, my God. I've been trying to sneak stuff into my kids' food forever, right? And um, what I, you know, you're making chili with, you got your hamburger uh, or you're making, you know, spaghetti sauce with your whatever meat or, or sauce that you've got. And I found that if you used about 10% organ meat that you, you know, um, sauteed it up with the other meats, you could get away with that before your kids would notice. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, I also just started telling my family, we're having new food of the week. Every week I would come up with something new. Like I had found out that, um, hmm, what is the name of the, there's a tuber. It's in the lily family that grows really great. And it's an ornamental, but I found out the tuber was edible. And I just saute that up. I'm like, everybody, we're having tuber this week, you know, or uh, we're having this or that. Or mesquite bean flour. I went on this mesquite bean flour and I was making them pancakes. And I found that if I put like 20% mesquite bean flour, they ran me out of the kitchen. But if I kept it below 10%, <laughs> you know, <laughs> by the way, oh, the other taco thing, Tuesdays. yeah, taco Tuesday, the other thing with, uh, organ meat, um, if you're doing liver, start with like a chicken liver or rabbit liver. They're a more mild tasting beef liver is a little stronger. And when you make a pate out of it with a lot of onions and mushrooms and garlic, that, so that way, when you grind that up into a paste, you're actually not really tasting much of the organ meat at all. And again, head over to the forums. Uh, Judson Carroll is an amazing guy with just so many recipes for how to cook all these really odd parts of animals. So, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Is that Katie that asked that question? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, I, I have gotten kicked out of the house more than a few times. <laughs> 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 yep. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for coming again. If you want to take care, uh, advantage of that package, um, you know, the book, oh my God, I think I've even got a copy of it here. The grow book, 288 pages. It goes into the, the three part system. We also talk a lot about compost and fertility. We go into how to make the 12 most, uh, 12, how to make common, uh, herbal medicines that will treat the 12 most common ailments that show up in a family. The book comes, uh, and it also comes with a year subscription to the Academy with all the certifications. Um, 
Even if you don't do any of that, please come join us in the forums. Take a part of the blogs, uh, posts. Um, take advantage of all the free resources we have. And as I said in the very beginning, um, if you're here, you're very likely uh, to be surviving uh, this coming decade. And I, I want to be in community with you. I want to know you. There's a lot of things we are all going to need to figure out. And the Grow Network has been built as a platform for us to share and collaborate and work together uh, to be able to solve some of these problems. And I'm very, 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 very hopeful. It's going to get very ugly. I, we, I, we know that, okay? We know that. But I'm very, very hopeful that with the collapse of the existing systems, if there are enough of us good people that can make it through this transition, we can really rebuild something that's amazing and wonderful and healthy and, and, and good. So I want to, I want to be with you and have you be a part of that. So um, come join us at the Grow Network and thank you so much for attending. Yeah. Thank you, a Super couple more things. Yeah. Just a couple more uh, quick questions. The, uh, to get to the forums, go to the grownetwork.com and click on forums. And, and yes, the presentation will uh, be sent out via link in the email here in just a few hours, the replay. Yeah. Yes, we're also looking at setting this up on a, a 72 hour thing so you can watch it anytime. So we'll let you know when that comes out. All right. Thank you, Marjorie. This has been great. All right. Thank you, Super J, for your help. Bye, everybody. Have a wonderful time. Go start that chicken flock. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys.